Ferrioli. We're coming to you live from Melbourne tonight. And joining me on the panel, inventor, author and scientist Saul Griffith, who wants to electrify Australia. Chief Executive of the Australian Energy Council, Sarah McNamara. In Sydney, because he's had a bit going on this week, Minister for Energy and Climate Change, Chris Bowen. The independent member for Goldstein, Zoe Daniel, and Energy and Climate Change Program Director at the Grattan Institute, Tony Wood. Please make them all feel very welcome. Thanks, Virginia. I migrated to Australia 20 years ago and made this beautiful country home. The part of the world I grew up, terms such as load shedding, blackouts, were part of day-to-day -day life. Years after years, every government would blame the previous government of mismanagement, incompetence, lack of leadership. To be honest, the energy crisis we're having now seems like deja vu. My question to the honorable panel is, despite being a country full of natural resources, why are we still in this crisis? How real these threats are and how are we gonna get out of this? So why are we here? Saul, we'll start with you. Uh, they say the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. And so it is with an energy crisis. The, the, the only real time to solve an energy crisis was a decade ago or 20 years ago. And so it is, in fact, possible to br blame previous governments for where we are because we haven't invested in uh, the, the grid resources we need. We haven't had a sufficient focus on what they call the demand side of energy. So we've focused a lot on making enough electricity, but we haven't been thinking about also changing out our gas systems in our houses, electrifying our vehicles. We're still short of a good vehicle, electric vehicle policy in Australia. So we are, we're paying for a uh, lack of planning over the last few decades right now. Um, and I'm very sympathetic to the challenge of the minister who's on the line. He's inheriting that problem. Um, and I'm concerned that Australia is going to see people try to monopolise and capitalise on this moment to make cynical short-term decisions, when really now is the moment we have to plan one decade ahead so that we're not revisiting this problem only much more frequently 10 years from now. We're going to hear from all the panel on this. I'll go to you first after that, though, Minister. Minister Bowen. Well, thanks, Sayed, and I certainly understand your question. And, look, there's a lot of things that are responsible for this situation. We're in this challenge, this crisis, and there's plenty I don't blame the previous government for. I don't blame them for flooding in coal mines. I don't blame them for unexpected outages in coal-fired power stations. I don't blame them for the geopolitical situation caused by the war in Ukraine. What I do hold them responsible for is a decade of a lack of investment, a lack of transmission, a lack of storage, a lack of renewable energy, which is really why we're in this crisis. There's, as I said, there's many things that have been leading to this crisis. The main one is coal fire power station outages, um, most of which have been unexpected because the fleet is ageing. Now, that, that is inevitable. What wasn't inevitable is that we haven't had the investment in renewable energy, the investment in transmission and the investment in storage of that renewable energy, so we're storing it for when we need it, over the last decade. We need to build 10,000 kilometres of transmission lines. We need to increase our storage by nine times. We've got a massive task and we're starting now. Uh, and that's the challenge, in that we've got some short-term challenges which we're dealing with and we've been actually able to avoid blackouts and load shedding up until now and everybody's working very hard to avoid that. Me, the regulators, the operator, the state and territory ministers all working very hard to avoid that. Um, but we've got a medium and longer-term challenge and we need to get on with it. And that's what we're doing. Today we signed our commitment to a 43% emissions reduction and an important part of that is transitioning to renewables, electric vehicles, the whole shebang. We've wasted 10 years. We don't have a minute to waste now. Zoe, Daniel, you were propelled into Parliament at least on part or in a large part because of frustration like Sayed. So how would you answer his question of how we got here? Yeah, thank you, Sayed. I think what's been happening is that the left hand has been deliberately not talking to the right hand for a long time. And that also goes to federal government not interacting effectively with state governments. So you've had state governments ramping down fossil fuels and you've had federal government not genuinely participating in the process to renewables or, in, in fact, in many cases, actively roadblocking that. And therefore, we're in the situation that we are in, where we're stuck in the middle because of both local and international factors. But I actually think that this is a huge opportunity. Uh, never waste a good crisis. We have structural problems in the system. We have a new government. We have people like me who've been elected on the back of an electorate that wants to end the climate wars. So let's fix those flaws and move forward. 
Sarah McNamara. Well, I'd like to speak a little bit in defence of our national electricity grid because it's actually served us really well since state and federal governments along the eastern seaboard came together in 1998 and decided they were going to combine their resources in order to reap the benefits for consumers of the economic efficiencies of a national grid. Now, that's worked really well, uh, mostly, for most of the time. Most of us can't remember large-scale blackouts, and I'd point out we haven't had any blackouts through this crisis. But what we're trying to do at the moment in Australia uh, is transform our grid into a lower emissions future through to net zero by 2050, and that's a really exciting goal. But the grid is the biggest piece of machinery in this country. It's incredibly technical, it's very fragile, and we are going to experience challenges along the way. And, of course, with any crisis, it's not just one factor that caused uh, the crisis that we're uh, experiencing at the moment. It's a coincidence of several things, a perfect storm. Uh, if we didn't have the kind of global pressures on coal and gas markets that Russia's invasion of the Ukraine has produced, uh, we'd be under less pressure domestically. And as the Minister mentioned, uh, we've had some unplanned coal outages, which have been really unfortunate. They've coincided with some schedule outages as well. And unfortunately, seasonally speaking, uh, we haven't been able to rely as much on wind and solar at the moment uh, to help prop up our need for supply. Now, there is sufficient supply in the grid, but unfortunately, the challenge we have at the moment isn't easily resolved by more renewables generation because we don't have a way to store that renewable generation in a long duration way to help us ease out um, those times when the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining. There's a lot to get to that we're already touching on and all the questions will take us there. But Tony Wood, before we move to our next question. The way I, the way I think about this um, is that we are children of our history. And our history is that we're a very large country with a relatively small population a huge energy resource. We have just about every energy source you can think of. And Zaid, so you mentioned this. Uh, what that's tends what makes to... it so bewildering. <laughs> well, that's exactly... But interesting what happens is when you have that, you actually squander it. And what we've been advantaged by is the way Sarah described we've been able to use the resources we've had and build an unusually strong economy in a, very, in a part of the world which is very remote from, every, from most of the rest of the world. But as we've done that, we've all, and we've built on that, and we've become a major energy exporter as well, we've not been taking, paying attention to what the consequences are. And now we've got to change, and that's hard to do. And we know where we're going to go. It's been agreed by both sides of politics. The Labor Party has been elected on that platform. Many people have voted for people like Zoe on that basis. And so that, hit, that potential is there. But coming from where we are, We've got to change what we do. It isn't just the coal generators we have to change. We're going to have to change. I live in Melbourne. We're going to have to stop using gas in our homes and so forth, right? This will not be easy, but the future is so clear. Getting there is not going to be as easy as we sometimes would like to think, but we can grasp it. Sayed, I just want to come back to you quickly before we move on. I don't know if that answers your question, but what are you most concerned about? Look, I'm, I'm the sole breadwinner of my family and, and I'm concerned by the you know, rapidly increasing cost of living. Mm. You know, the fuel prices are going up, the, the, um, the interest rates have started to go up as well, and now we have the energy crisis in our hand. So it does concern me in a way that, you know, where this leads us. And, and did we not see this coming? Um, mm. Did we not plan well in advance? And that's what sort of I would like to know the, okay, we, we are at that point, but what are we going to do to get out of this. Said raises a good point there about did we not see this coming? <laughs> and I want to go back to you, Saul, about this. And we've heard from a number of members, including the Minister and Sarah as well on the panel, that, you know, so many of those outages that we have at our traditional uh, power plants are, are unplanned. But at the same time, they weren't really. I mean, you, you don't maintain your power station as, as, as regularly as you should if you know that it's winding down to the end of its time, if that actually is being uh, removed from the market. Uh, we saw so many signs of this problem coming down the track, didn't we? I mean, most people who studied in detail could see this coming, precisely for what you mentioned. Our, our coal fleet, even before this crisis, has typically only 80, 70 or 80 per cent been running for the last few years. So it's not nearly as reliable. We're under-investing in it. It's sort of sensible decision to under-invest if you're one of those power... You don't throw producers. away you know, good money if the, if the whole system's but shutting we, down. We just failed to invest enough on the other side of the equation 
And my concern right now is really to tie it to the other part of your question about cost of living. Um, average Australian household last year, $5,000 a year would be the cost of all of their petrol and diesel, the cost of their electricity, the cost of their gas. That'll go up to about $7,000 this year, and that's extremely meaningful, especially with the other inflationary mm -hmm. pressures. And I'm concerned that we're not going to take the opportunity of this energy crisis to invest in the Australian household, because what is coming in this future that we can all see is that we're going to have a lot more solar on rooftops because that's the cheapest form of electricity that exists today and will in the future. We're going to put electric vehicles in all the driveways. We're going to electrify the heating systems, even the cooking systems in all the homes. And we now need to start to think about 10 million Australian households as infrastructure because they're going to be where the majority of the storage is because 20 million electric vehicles is going to dwarf the size of the Snowy Hydro project. And so the opportunity right now is in addressing this energy crisis and thinking about future energy crisis is to get a two for one and invest in the Australian household as though it was energy infrastructure, which well, it will be. And yeah. then by doing that, we actually, you can now model out that we're going to be saving the Australian household three or four or five thousand dollars a year by 2030 if we have a wholesale commitment to electrification and we prioritise the household and put their voice in the conversation as we negotiate the, the new grids, new rules of the grid, which obviously we now need to renegotiate. We have a question coming up about, about the, the requirement of the household in a moment, so we'll get to that. But I just want to get a sense from the room, if I can, a show of hands and vocal acclamation, if you like. If there's some sort of um, incentive or financial help for you to make that electrification switch, and here in Melbourne, in Victoria, as has been mentioned, we're very reliant on gas. Are you prepared? Are you happy? Do you want to make that switch? Um, you, need, you need money or financial help to make that switch, some support in terms of the, the heat pump that you might need to use to fix up your heating and, your, and, uh, and, and to change your, um, your cooking. That's what we're looking for. Well, that's, and that's the real challenge. It's, and I know you'll get to that about, you know, who do you incentivise, who do you actually subsidise and who do you not? My question's for Sol. You say um, you think, you believe that Australian households hold the key to transitioning to renewables. But why should Australians be expected to tackle the climate crisis that's been created by large corporations and aided by our government's lack of action? Uh, so I, I don't think it should be the household's responsibility to solely solve the climate crisis. But for a very practical reason, I talk about households and small businesses as the near-term emission reductions that we can do. We, could, we can quibble about whether it's 40 or 43 or 50 or 60 percent reductions we need by 2030. It's a, it's a high number. Let's be really frank and honest. Green steel doesn't work yet and probably won't till next decade. Hydrogen at scale won't be done, if it's done at all, until next decade. So we're not going to eliminate any of these big industrial and other emissions until next decade. How do you get those emissions that you need right now? And it turns out that the technologies they're a little bit expensive today, but solar was a little bit expensive 10 years ago and now is dirt cheap, um, are the things that are owned by the Australian household and by Australia's small businesses by virtue of being similar things. That's our vehicles, that's our hot water heaters, that's our space heaters, that's our rooftops for our solar and, our, and even our kitchens. So 42% of the emissions that occur in our domestic economy happen from that small set of machines that are in every Australian household. And here's the reality. In the next 10 or 20 years, 10 million households are going to replace all of those machines anyway. So to get to the nub of the question, which is, hey, it's now our responsibility, is it? This takes us to a key point in your book, The Big Switch, about who do you incentivise, who do you subsidise, where does the money go? It's going to be about money, isn't it, in order to enable people to make that change? Absolutely. This is the, the exchange of finance for fuel. So when you build a yeah. fossil fuel system, you have to keep on paying fuel prices and that they have volatility. If you finance solar and the electric vehicle and the things, you have price stability, but you've, you've got to make those payments. So it's that substitution. And very critically, it's why I sort of think about Australia's 10 million households as national infrastructure. It will be where the majority of our batteries live, by virtue of they'll be parked in okay. our driveways. Uh, and we need, we need to finance the, our, the Australian household pref with the same preferential financing that we give to infrastructure in Australia. Mm -hmm. 
and you should think about our cars and our homes in the same way as, and with the same priority that we think about Snowy 2.0. Okay. Uh, Zoe Daniel, I feel like you're sort of a household representative this <laughs> evening. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for the question. And I think my answer to why should we do it as households is because we can. And also because we're sick of waiting for our politicians to do it for us. So we have to force it. And I think that's what happened at the election to some degree, that community stood up and said, enough stuffing around. It's time to actually move this needle. And now we have a government that's in place, but sitting underneath that is a group of people that have voted to end the climate wars, to actually move this forward, to incentivise solar, to create an environment where people can actively action the things that Saul's talking about to electrify their homes. And, you know, there's all sorts of pieces underneath that. The minister talked about community energy. I've been working with one of the communities in Goldstein about a community energy project. But again, the interaction between the community battery and the grid has to be sorted out to mm. make that a viable project. So that's a piece of that process. That's a connectivity job. I exactly. To, to make that feasible and profitable for the community, but, mm. but to enable locally generated, stored and used energy to take the, the pressure off the grid. But I think the other thing is, you know, the elephant in the room, I, I feel, seems to be why are we not getting a bigger return on our assets when it comes to our export of gas? And we talked about... <laughs> Virginia, you, you, you said it's going to cost money, and of course it's going to cost money, and it's a complex exercise. Well, you know, there's this windfall profit happening, and uh, the word tax is a dirty word, so let's call it a price equalisation levy. What about if you tax the difference on what those companies were making before the war in Ukraine and what they're making now, and consider how much money that might mean to put solar on rooftops and create this electrification that we're talking about? No, and there's, there's precedent. Norway did this, right? Norway... <laughs> It's even worse than that, Virginia. It's even worse than that. Because you go right back to when we started exporting our LNG and we put in place a thing called the Petroleum Resource Rent Tax. Yes. We designed a tax that nobody pays. What a clever idea that was. <laughs> now, that's the problem. That is our gas, all of us Australians, and, the, and we sold this gas without getting the tax, the return, which is always talking about, should have been coming to us. I mean, the gas users should benefit as well. The companies have obviously got to pay tax, but this idea that we've got... that The companies are not paying to use the, the rent on the resource that they're extracting at any likely appropriate rate. That should be fixed, in addition to what Zoe's talking about, when you've got companies making windfall profits. I think there's a challenge there, because the, the first one, for the minister, is a much harder one to fix, because resource rent taxes will be very problematic, and we know what the industry will say when he tries that. Sure. But... The other one, I think, should be easier. Well, let me go to the Minister. I assume want to hear from um, Sarah on this, because I've, I think you argue that the companies are paying their, their fair share, even though the Australia Institute showed that at least five major companies paid, I think, zero tax in the last few years. Well, Virginia, my members aren't, um, you know, are not as involved in the export market. Um, and I do think one of the challenges, though, is uh, it's very difficult for governments to retrospectively apply... Um, taxes and controls on uh, resources that are already being exported overseas on long-term contracts. You've got to be very careful about sovereign risk issues. Um, there may be opportunities to look at uh, how we might better reserve gas domestically for prospective um, gas exploration, because gas is certainly going to be um, a very useful part of our um, energy market transition for, for some years to come. Do you, do you regret um, Chris Bowen not being part of a government that actually decided to reserve gas in Australia? And uh, is there still an argument for us to step in and do something about that now? It still will be a key transition fuel for, for us. Yeah, there certainly is an argument for making sure that we have enough gas in Australia from Australian gas production. Absolutely, I agree. And the question is the right tool to do that. And we've announced that we will look at reform there. The, there's a current um, thing called the trigger, but it's not really a trigger. It's yeah. not really... It's not really designed for this purpose. It's certainly not any, of any use in this purpose. So we have announced that we will look at strengthening that and making that more effective. And, you know, we, we've, we've begun that process because, at the moment, the levers the government have uh, has at our disposal are pretty blunt, to be, fra to be frank, and they need to be improved. And we have said that we will do that. We need to look at the problem and what the right solution is. It's, 
it's very easy to say here's the problem, uh, but you've got to design your solution very carefully. And a lot of ideas might might you know be very worthy ideas, but they don't actually fix this problem. They don't I actually change this problem before us. So that is that is a very legitimate debate. I mean, Sarah's right. We do have to worry about sovereign risk. We do have to respect existing contracts. I 100% agree with that. We're not we're not going to start you know. Uh, going down that road, but no, there but, is but, a but you have pushed away the idea of a windfall tax. Well, as I said, that's th what we're looking at is a is the correct solution to the problem we're faced. We're facing at the moment, and I don't think that actually would change the situation we're facing at the moment. What might change the situation yeah. is, a, is a more effective lever, a more effective trigger for us to be able to deploy when necessary, reluctantly and not lightly, but when necessary, in the national interest, because the national interest should be should come first. Well, I think the argument's about something that's actually ongoing and constantly, you know, drawing something from our resource. Can I quickly, quickly <laughs> hear from Tony Wood and from Saul on that? Tony? Well, I would respectfully disagree on this windfall profit tax, because when companies are getting outrageous prices, making huge returns, which has nothing to do with what they've done as clever business people, they're getting returns the above what the they could have normally expected. That's the, that's the core issue, I think. Yep. Now, the Minister's correct. What you need to think of, how would you do something like this? The first thing I would do is to say, look, pay, sell gas into this country at a fair price. Not what, you've been, what you used to sell it at when you had all your other gas on contracts. Not take advantage of the situation. Sell it at a fair price or we're going to impose a tax on the profit you're making above a fair price. That would be... You could take it off when the problem's gone away. Yeah. And it seems to me it wouldn't be a sovereign risk risk either. So? I think that's a totally reasonable idea, but I, I think we're, we're playing today's problem where we, we've got to be making today's problem solve the next few decades. And let's look at Norway. They were a very, very gas-rich nation. They made a sovereign wealth fund. They have announced that electric vehicles will be the only vehicles that you can buy in 2025. And that the... Be, by virtue of being a wealthy country from those natural gas windfalls, they mm. are helping subsidise the population into that. Let's talk about that in the Australian context because the energy conversation is always bigger and more complicated than you think. If we were buying Australians, helping Australians drive electric vehicles, it would be two cents a kilometre to drive instead of 20 cents a kilometre. Of the $5,000 a year that's hurting people in mm. their energy expenditure, the vast majority for the Australian household is in the vehicles. So we should be implementing uh, price mechanisms, uh, like Tony just mentioned, in order to be subsidising the things that we would like to happen in the future and be using today to pay for it. Just before I go to Ethan Miller, our next question, uh, Mr <coughs> Bowen, anything that you hear there that's terribly attractive to the government? Well, as I said, you know, we're, we're looking at what levers that will work for the situation we're facing. Would those levers work? Well, what would work is, is a reformed and revised um, gas trigger. That's what we think would work. I understand the arguments that are being put, but I don't think they're the right solution for this situation that we're facing at the moment. Now, let's be clear. I think there is a social licence on gas companies. We've been talking to the gas companies and asking them to put more gas into the system, and they have been. But at its core, I do have to say again, this crisis is primarily being led by coal-fired power station outages, uh, not, not, not a shortage of gas in the short term, a shortage of coal-fired power. That's what's, that's what's driving all the action that me and the regulators and the operator and the state and territory ministers are making at the moment. So we're dealing with these issues. But, you know, as I said right at the beginning, we've got to have the medium-term and long-term plans as well at the same time. And that's that national integration, that national plan that I've talked about, including hydrogen and the big conversion that we need to get underway. Thank you. I think we all acknowledge that the weaponisation of the climate wars has been regrettable over some time now. However, looking forwards and um, with any good plan, it's founded on actions, accountabilities and success measures. So my question is directed to Minister Bowen and that is, casting your mind forwards in three years' time, coincidentally as we head towards the polls, what would success look like? So, in this field, Minister, what would success look like when we go to the polls? Well, success will look like getting on with the job and bedding down our reforms and people will be able to say they ended the climate wars and they got on with it. They got on with the job of building transmission renewables, they were a responsible international citizen and they created a lot of jobs as they did so and a lot of investment, particularly in the regions. We've got to bring Australia with us. There's been too much division in the cities versus regions, people saying climate change is an inner city obsession. It's an opportunity for the whole country. Yes, it's a challenge, but it's a massive opportunity for the entire country. A lot of jobs to be created as we build the green hydrogen, the transmission, the renewables, the lot. That's what success will 
look like. And in terms of accountability, I'll be reporting annually to Parliament on our progress and any problems we've had, any success we've had. Uh, and I look forward um, to putting that very openly and transparently before the Parliament as Climate Change Minister. It's a commitment we took the election. Mm -hmm. It'll be an opportunity to assess how we're doing as a country, how the government's doing, and to, for the Parliament to focus on the issue. Let's hear from everyone on that. What will success look like, do you think, in three years, Sarah? Uh, from an electricity industry perspective, we want to continue on um, our transition to a lower emissions future. Uh, we're committed to net zero by 2050 and actually uh, the organisation I work for has an interim target in 2035 of a 55% reduction on emissions. Do you reckon the government should um, take uh, well, that we, one We'd love to well? start the conversation, um, Virginia, and I'm hopeful we might have that opportunity um, sometime in the future. Um, but also, you know, to date in Australia, the electricity industry has really done all of the heavy lifting on emissions reduction and climate change, reaching climate change targets. And what we want to do uh, in the electricity industry is now start to help other sectors um, begin their transformational journey, sectors like agriculture and transport. And that's where the sorts of electrification um, uh, projects that Saul's talking about could really come into play. And I believe that within in three years' time, we should be um, have some really exciting progress in those discussions. Tony Wood? The Grattan Institute, we like numbers. And the number we should see, and the chart we should see, and the chart Mr Bowen should be able to present, is the chart that shows our emissions that were not heading towards net zero by 2050. That chart has bent down. The number that the government's put in place today is on a straight line to net zero by 2050. If by in three years' time we've got bent that curve so it's in that direction, that will be a major change from where we've been. I think, and it also means that we have to do not just the electricity, as Sarah said, but the other major policy, and we're not going to talk about that this evening, that the ministers are going to have to implement, is the changes to the safeguard mechanism, which are going to bring down emissions in the industry, heavy industries, yeah. which are becoming the biggest source of emissions, and transport. So there's some big challenges there, but we can do it. There's the number, there's the target. The Minister can judge his performance by that. Sorry, Daniel. Uh, in terms of performance, I think my measure is rebuilt trust, and that's to do with delivery and performance. Uh, as someone said to me this week, it's very hard to focus on integrity when you can't hit your house and you can't afford to buy a lettuce. So I just say to the Minister, don't lose sight of why we're here and what we're trying to do. When you've been jettisoned into a crisis immediately after the election, it's easy to start getting stuck in that and forget what the big picture is, which is to rebuild trust and accountability and integrity for our communities. So, three years' time. I think the lesson from the election as represented by Zoe, was this was not only the climate election, but this was very genuinely a community election. Uh, it was about households, it was about communities, it was about how they plan for the future, irregardless of which party or if I was an independent, judging my success in three years, if I wanted, and I'm judging that success of if I want to win the next election in Australia, I think the project is measured by whether or not you can prove through demonstration communities, through implementing in real households, that we are going to lower that total cost of living for Australian households on their energy bills. Um, and if you do that, you will absolutely win the next election. It will be an enormous success. Yes, we should also make the investments in heavy, heavy industry, but let's prove to Australia that we can lead the world by, by a mile on this transition. We can lower energy bills, improve quality of life, improve the air quality inside your home because the natural gas you're burning in your home is poisoning your children. We have everything to win. That is totally achievable in the three-year cycle that we're talking about. And that's all we have time for tonight. So please thank our panel, Saul Griffith, Sarah McNamara, Chris Bowen, Zoe Daniel and Tony Wood. Thank you all. Great conversation. Ah, those energy clubs, I tell you. Thank you for your questions and to you at home for joining the conversation as well. Next week, David Spears joins you live from Werribee, one of Australia's fastest growing communities in Melbourne's outer west. And you can register to be in the audience on our website. And you can join me tomorrow morning on ABC Radio Melbourne. Until then, good night, go well.